Okay, well, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to our uh, third webinar for the for the Alliance High Tunnel series for native plants, uh, High Tunnels for Native Plants. Um, this third episode is Economics of Native Plant Nurseries. Today we're going to be having Mervyn Wallace of Missouri Wildflower Farm speaking with us today. Uh, if everyone would just take a chance on uh, on filling out the um, excuse me, rather, we will have a poll available, but it uh, looks like I'll need to set that up. Um, so I'll set that up later. I just neglected to do that now. Um, <clears throat> uh, we will have a chat box on the right side of your screen. Uh, feel free to talk in that. There will also be a Q&A box at the at the bottom center of your screen. Uh, if you would, feel free to enter any questions you might have in that. And uh, once again, I'll set up a, a quick poll. And uh, when that becomes available, I'll mention that in the chat box. I just neglected to have it set up going in. Um, just want to get started with a quick welcoming presentation with us. My name, uh, again, is Nate Weston with the Beaver Watershed Alliance. I'm a program coordinator. <clears throat> Um, the Beaver Watershed Alliance is a 501c3 nonprofit organization located in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, our mission is to proactively protect, enhance, and sustain water quality in Beaver Lake and the integrity of its watershed. And uh, we primarily do that through education, outreach, technical assistance, and BMPs. Um, BMPs is jargon for best management practices. Uh, we also do scientific monitoring and research. Um, the Beaver Watershed is located in northwest Arkansas. It is the drinking water source for one in six Arkansans, and that's roughly half a million people, 500,000. Um, on the left side of the screen, you'll see uh, several watersheds. The Beaver Watershed is divided into, or sub-watersheds, rather. Um, one of the primary issues facing the, the Beaver Lake watershed is sedimentation and, uh, and er erosion, which results in that sedimentation of our, of our drinking water sources. Um, that heavily impacts drinking water quality and, and water quality for wildlife, and uh, one of our major major goals is to reduce water quality, especially in priority watersheds like those you see colored in red and orange. Um, a lot of people don't know sediment is the number one factor in reducing drink in reducing water quality, just due to the uh, fine particulate matter, uh, reducing habitat for fish, wildlife, as well as being very very difficult and expensive to filter out for drinking water purposes. Um, on the screen right now is, uh, a, is a, a map of Northwest Arkansas and the drinking water sources and their utility providers for the area. The blue triangles are wa raw water outtakes for the, for the lake with the outline of our watershed in gray and the various drinking water utilities which take that, drink, take that raw water after it's been uh, treated and deliver this to your house to households in the area for agriculture industry and uh, things of that nature um, we do a lot of education and outreach uh, this is a form of that so we do a lot of workshops and uh, farm field days um, this particular one was a rain ready workshop we did in Fayetteville and that's to promote low impact developments which is uh, basically ways uh, developments can become more integrated with the natural natural features, natural landscape, and natural uh, functions, such as uh, stormwater filtration and things like that. Uh, we also work out or work with a lot of landowners um, to we go out and visit them on their property. We work with them to promote uh, help them promote voluntary best management practices on their property. Um, that can be things like uh, pasture management or forest management for wildlife, uh, nutrient management and uh, for nutrient reductions and things like that. This is basically just a way we can work directly with landowners to actively encourage the, uh, the participation in conservation programs as well as the implementation of those best management practices. Uh, one of the other things we do, and we, we don't really have the ability to do this ourselves, but we partner with several other organizations who have the uh, materials, facilities, means, and resources to do things like stream bank restorations. And uh, here this is a uh, stream bank that was previously heavily eroded with uh, incised stream banks. It was contributing a lot of sediment to the watershed. 
And um, this is uh, Rock Creek, which is a primary tributary in the West Fork of the White River. It's a priority area for us and as well as our partners. And uh, this program is through the uh, in our National Resources Conservation Services Regional Conservation Partnership Program, or RCPP as we often refer to it. Um, they funded this program, and uh, which was which we assisted in, but it was but it was um, the restoration itself was completed and planned by the Watershed, uh, excuse me, Watershed Conser Conservation Resources Center. And uh, they're very, very viable partners with us. We also partner with uh, partners um, just like, again, Watershed Conservation Resource Center and others to do scientific monitoring, such as in this case, which is also in Rock Creek of uh, erosion. So this would kind of be the before of what we saw in the, the previous slide. Um, this is a, a heavily incised eroded stream bank. Um, stream banks like this are heavy contributors to sedimentation in our waterways. And uh, we have a partnership with Watershed Conservation Resource Center to go out and um, monitor the erosion over a, over a multi-phase uh, sequence to get an idea of how much particulate matter is being contributed from these streams into our watersheds and waterways. Uh, we also do, uh, in scientific monitoring and research, we do uh, storm, storm, fl storm flow reduction uh, through a pond optimization program which is basically a study to analyze how much peak storm flow would be reduced through the construction of a series of ponds in upper level catchment basins throughout the watershed. And we're seeing some promising results on that and some promising data. Um, you now this, uh, this is a series that's basically on native plants and a lot of y'all might wonder, you know, what does this have to do with native plants? You know, you're talking about erosion and things like that. Um, plants are, are foundational to, to ecosystems. Um, they help maintain stream banks, they reduce erosion, they promote habitat, they also filter stormwater. And so they're, uh, they're a very major component, a keystone component of a lot of um, natural, natural management. Um, up here on the top left, we see button bush with a butterfly on it. Um, we have uh, tree plantings like we see on the top center. We work with uh, partners like here. We uh, have a seed collection, a voluntary seed collection program with the Watershed Conservation Resource Center. And seed collected from this program went directly into the restoration program that we saw earlier. Not necessarily that one, I don't know, but but uh, certainly projects like that one. Um, other, other programs we're working with in the area and partners are with the uh, Arkansas Audubon which reaches out and uh, partners with landowners to promote both uh, native plant materials, seeds, and uh, things like that for promoting wildlife or promoting uh, butterfly habitat and or pollinator habitat. Um, they're still looking for people in Northwest Arkansas to promote, uh, pr to propagate switchgrass and things like that. So they still have several things they need. Uh, we also work with landowners to promote riparian areas for filtering stormwater, and uh, so we have riparian buffer demonstrations. Um, on the bottom right uh, is a low-impact development site, like what I talked about earlier. Uh, these are sites where stormwater would flow off pervious pavements, like the asphalt we see down here, into modified uh, pervious or low-impact development structures, like we see with the um, the uh, tile parking area in the center and uh, the grassy areas in between. Those are areas where stormwater can leave those previous surfaces and become filtered and uh, reduce peak flow in our streams, which reduces sedimentation, flooding, and several other factors. That, um, these native plants are also useful in landscaping projects like we see here up uh, is a beautiful rain garden program installed at a uh, Hobbs State Park here in Northwest Arkansas, the Hobbs State Forest. Um, this was another Audubon Arkansas program where they were planting uh, plants to, uh, to promote in their, in their propagation projects. A uh, picture I took of a uh, rose milkweed or swamp milkweed. So as you can see, it's got a young monarch caterpillar on it. So, so these are invaluable for those kind of projects. Another thing we do a lot of is uh, invasive species removal. So here, one of our one of our volunteers is removing a bush honeysuckle, which is a highly invasive understory shrub. Uh, I know Mervyn's probably seen this. Oh yeah. Um, 
what, whenever you take out an invasive understory shrub, a lot of times uh, you, you have to replace it with something to fill that ecological niche. And so if we remove bush honeysuckle, we highly encourage the landowners or the project managers to, to replace that uh, invasive understory shrub with a be beneficial native understory shrub. Otherwise, we'll see a, a resurgence of either this exact species or a different one moving in. Um, we also use native plants in demonstration projects. Uh, here we're using a simulation. You can see the orange trees on the left. And uh, this is our, our annual science fair, Seki Day. Uh, here we're demonstrating to people how, how uh, channelized streams differ in form and function and erosion and life cycle to, to uh, sinuous or natural streams like we see on the left. And uh, naturally, native plants, uh, perform a, a major role in, in maintaining the health and integrity of, of uh, na natural streams. We can't do this work without all of, all of our partners. Uh, we're very blessed to have so many great partners in this. And uh, I just want to take this moment to thank y'all for, for attending. Uh, I believe our poll is up and going, so I'm just going to go ahead and launch that. So on the bottom center of your screen, you should see a, a button that says polls. Feel free to, to enter some enter your information in that or your answers. Just some, some feedback gives us an idea of who's participating in this program and uh, how beneficial this program might be uh, to, to participants in the area and, uh, and its end goal. Um, I haven't talked about that yet. Um, this is a pilot program through the Natural Resources Conservation Service, uh, their Conservation Innovation Grant. And uh, the goal of this program is to promote the production of native plant materials through not, not only in the Beaver Lake watershed, but also in Northwest Arkansas in, in general. Um, some of our surrounding states have had very successful programs in this, such as Missouri. Um, Mervyn Wallace is going to be our, our host or our panelist today, and he's going to be talking about some of the programs he's been working on and uh, some of the successes and challenges that he's, he's faced uh, working on a, working in his his nursery, which is um, Missouri Wildflowers Nursery. Um, the, the goal of this program is to in, include, introduce an option through the NRCS High Tunnel Program, which is very popular for the production of native plant materials uh, in court, as well as the existing scenarios of, of uh, cut flowers and vegetables. <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop my presentation. And Mervyn, I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute myself and start the presentation for, for yours. So just let me know when you want me to go to the next slide. OK. And I've got something right there. I'll click on that and I make it disappear. There we go. There's the first slide. Um, I do want to say that a few weeks, uh, a month or more ago, when Nate first brought this up to me and he was talking about high tunnels, I was uh, envisioning greenhouses with sidewalls that are about six feet high because that's what I had been introduced to at the beginning. And then I saw Nate's picture in the uh, uh, in his flyer, and it was uh, greenhouses just like I've got pretty much. This is our oldest greenhouse, and we have small pots, we call them. I'll describe those pretty soon. Um, it's, I'm not crazy about it because it's uh, 30 feet wide and it requires a great big sheet of plastic that's very hard to get on. It's heavy and all of that, but they managed to get them on and they've sort of worked that out. Um, let's go to the next slide. We use a lot of, several of these greenhouses, they're 16 feet wide, uh, about seven feet, six and a half feet tall. Um, all of these greenhouses that we have, we put shade cloth on them in the summertime and we put uh, plastic on them in the winter. We are using clear plastic now, I believe. We used to use uh, white plastic. I'm getting into more details here and not about money. So, although all of that is <laughs> cost money, that's cost of goods, uh, especially those pots and potting soil. Um, 
Let's go to the next slide. In uh, 2014, I'll, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, we bought the state highway property, which my land used to surround and now it's just part of it. Uh, they downsized in Missouri on their uh, sheds that they operate from. And so we got five and a half acres plus uh, some buildings that are very valuable. And we've been putting greenhouses up on these. The greenhouses you see on the left uh, with the white metal siding on them at the base, those are 20 feet wide and we're pretty much uh, set on those now in the future when we, if we buy more. Uh, the one you're looking at straight in front in this picture is one that we bought several years ago from a school. It's 30 feet wide, uh, Herman High School they decided to get rid of it and we got it and uh, we've been using it for shade structure. We just, we just put shade cloth on top of it. Uh, this area that you're looking at has plants in it now. I took the picture yesterday. Uh, pretty soon we're gonna have this all cleared out and uh, we're gonna be putting seeded pots, the same pots we sell plants in. Uh, we put the seeds in quite a few of them and uh, give them a cold treatment through the winter and they germinate in the spring in the pot. We have to thin them out because we put extra seeds in, but uh, it doesn't disturb the plants nearly as much as using plugs that you would put in. Let's go on to the next slide. This is the nursery where it says Missouri Wildflowers Nursery there. There's uh, several greenhouses and then a big area that uh, will end up with a shade structure over, but right now we just, it's just out open flat, just waiting for it. Um, an important part in, in this picture, an important part of the nursery is this pond that you see. That's where we get our water from. Um, we have a really neat setup with a pump that runs on variable speed motors that create a constant pressure of 60 pounds, almost constant, uh, compared to having an air tank for a water system where the pressure goes up and down between say 30 and 60 pounds. And you're sitting there with the water squirting way out there and then coming back towards you. Um, the state highway property uh, Nate, you got that little pointer. There you go, right there, that, that spot. That, uh, that building that he's got his pointer just above or on is, uh, that's the big building that they, uh, they put their equipment, it's got six bays in it with garage doors. Uh, we are using it right now to, to uh, clean seed and store and dry seeds in. It came equipped with several fans that help to circulate air. It's just wonderful, wonderful for that. Um, in the winter time though, we uh, seed those pots that I was talking about and haul them down to the area where we were just taking or looking at with the, the previous picture. Um, I think we're ready for the next, uh, or we're just to get rid of the slides now and let me go to, uh, oh, no, we got one more. Um, yes. No, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm lost for a second. Yeah, let's skip, uh, let's skip the sales area for a little bit and uh, just let me, let, let, put me on the, the, the view. Um, I see me up there in the right hand corner, but I don't see the full screen with me in it. Um, there we go. I want to talk about the income for a, we'll talk a little bit about expenses, but mostly about income and how we get the uh, ways we, we go about promoting the products. But let me first uh, uh, give you an idea of what the, the pots that we sell, and I'm gonna hold them up here. 
That looks good. This is a quart pot. It's four and a half inches square and five inches deep. Uh, this is used a lot in the nursery trade. Um, I'd like to encourage you, I might say it more than one time, pick pots that are standard in the trade. And with uh, wildflowers, the wildflower industry, at least in Missouri, this quart pot is very common. We sell, there's another one here I'll show you right here. Uh, a lot of times we have, we have basically two sizes we refer to and two prices, in which I'll give you prices in a little bit. The quart pot and then anything smaller than that. So we've got at this point three pots that are smaller than, I'll hold it up there where you can see it. Um, and for comparison there. Uh, this is 32 uh, plants in a tray, plugs in a tray or pots. The ones that we used starting out originally as a smaller pot uh, have a hole in the bottom, holes in the bottom and they drain real well so you have to have them up on a table uh, but the advantage to them is that the roots air prune if you have a tap root. Um, we have to buy these from a place in uh, Oregon, so it's not very, you pay a lot for the pots. These other ones are, are much less expensive. And we went with this size for quite a while, and now we're down to just strawberries that we we're growing in them. Uh, I think that's it. We have done some seed a minute in this size. Um, so we got the, the big pot and then the three smaller sizes. And then we sometimes go to, especially with trees and shrubs, and uh, we do gallon pots and they vary a lot in at least brown pots. We have a three, this is about a gallon and a half. There's gallon and then a trade gallon, which is four, uh, three quarts instead of four quarts. But we have pots that go up to five gallons. But I didn't want to hold one up in here. Uh, that plant that is in the gallon pot, did I hold that where you can see that sign? That's American Beautyberry. Uh, that's our featured plant of the year, and this is what the berries look like on it. Pretty neat. Um, I keep getting prompted to fill out that poll, but I'm going to get rid of it. Um, so those are our pot size. We all, uh, that's the pot sizes. Before we I've been selling the quart pots from the very beginning, but there was a period of time when we sold uh, bare root plants and we no longer do that for various reasons. Um, one is our season for that is about six, was about six weeks in the spring. Um, when we dug the plants, we put them in water as soon as we dug them in a bucket. We got them moved into uh, boxes with sawdust as a packing material just layered in. We kept them wet from the time we got them until they left the nursery. Uh, we did a lot of mail order of those. Um, but uh, a disadvantage, well, is the short period of time for selling them. And with these pots, you've got year round that you can sell. And you can plant the potted plants year round if you want, if you need to. Um, one thing that happened about the time we quit was Lowe's and other places was started selling. <laughs> uh, never mind. Thought I had a fly on my head. That is almost a joke, but there's a fly flying around in here. Um, it was the cursor. Thank goodness. I'm going to move it over to the side and not touch it again. Um, the bare root plants that Lowe's began to sell bare root plants in plastic bags. And they were totally dry and the plants were dead. So we just got out of it because I'd go to sales and people would say, oh, don't buy those. They're not going to live. So we just quit doing that. Uh, we do sell seeds. And if we sold just these seed packets, 
we would really be hurting for money in terms of seed sales. So we sell, uh, that's the front which we print. We pay to have the back, when we buy the packets, we pay to have the backside printed with common information on them. Um, that's, uh, we do sell a lot of seed, uh, seeds and packets, but we sell most of our seed bulk, uh, individual species, and we also sell uh, uh, mixes. And we make, we make a lot of pounds of our, what we call our deep soil mix. We sell some uh, dry shell, shallow or shallow soil mix, which is what would be what you would find on a glade pretty much. Um, but seeds are sold in the winter generally and in the nursery trade, I refer to that as our Christmas tree money when, sh when people are selling our poinsettias, which other nurseries sell things like that to make it through the winter. We sell everything native to make it through. Um, uh, how do we, how or where do we sell? Uh, we sell retail at the nursery. There's where I need that slide now of the sales area. If you can get that up, Nate. Um, one more. There you go, there you go. Um, this, we've had this set up for quite a while. We've had sales areas in other places over time, but this is working really well. It's getting a little bit old and needing some refurbishment, but um, we have it divided up into shade in the lower left side and sun in the upper right side, and then uh, rain garden in the lower right side, and just a little bit of more prairie and other species in the upper left. So when people come here, we can tell them where to find stuff uh, fairly well and they don't have to just hunt and peck so much. Uh, we also use this though, because we sell plants mail order and we do a lot of that. We did a lot of huge amount of mail order. I think it was almost twice as much this year with the COVID deal. A lot of people came here and bought also uh, but uh, we didn't sell it as much at places away from the nursery, which we often do. Um, so when, they're, when we're filling out the mail or, or when we're pulling plants for the mail order, we use the sales area also at the same time for that. So there'd be two or three people running around pulling plants to fill orders. And this spring, when we were just going really strong on the mail orders, um, up there towards the back of this area, there was a big pile of uh, flats that hold the pots stacked up. And a week before I hadn't noticed that. And I asked about it. Well, they had gone through all those, there were like three stacks of flats there and they were average, probably close to three feet high. That was a lot of flats they went through. So someone is spending all day long pulling plants up and putting in this sales area and then other people are taking them out and customers are coming and buying them. The neat thing about this is though for the pulling plants for orders, um, it's, it's sort of like a keyboard you, uh, on a typewriter. You know where everything is and you just go and pull them and you don't have to go over two or three acres of area to pull plants like we would if uh, we were going to where they're being grown at at the nursery. <clears throat> um, so I did briefly mention that we sell at events away from the nursery. That's another way that we sell plants. Um, some of the places we sell are like nature centers that the conservation department has. We do that in the spring early, in April usually. Uh, we keep all the money from a sale like that. But then there are other sales where we do, you can go to the, you can get rid of that slide if you want to now. Uh, we go to fundraisers, uh, some, we sell at fundraisers for uh, not-for-profit organizations, uh, and we do several of those. We give them a 15% of the sales. Um, 
there are many times in the spring, we are doing this from March, April, and May, and almost all of May now, but used to, we do one or two sales on a weekend, and now we're doing hopefully not over three, but there's been a few times where we did four sales. We have three trucks for hauling plants, and we have trailers and, uh, to go with the trucks if we need to. One of the trucks is a great big box truck, and for big sales, we can take that full and our best sale we ever had, that's four layers in a box truck. truck. We came back with six flats of plants one year from a sale. Um, Kirkwood Farmers Market in St. Louis is another place that we've been selling for years. Yeah, we only sell on Saturdays now, uh, five weekends, March through uh, first weekend in May. Uh, it's not unusual to take, we take pre-orders to all of the sales, and it's not unusual to take as much as uh, seven to $10,000 worth of plants to a, a pre-orders to one of these sales. Plus, until this year, we were taking plants for people to pick from at the sale, but uh, we can't do that. We didn't do that in most of the places this year uh, because of COVID. And what we did this year was take uh, prepaid pre-orders. Uh, people just came and either picked up the, the orders or we uh, picked them out for them, went and got them and put them in their car or they put them in their car. At the Kirkwood Farmers Market, we pay $75 for a booth space, booth rental, and we uh, have, buy a city uh, business license. And that's a pretty good deal. I would encourage you if you get into uh, doing farmers markets to pick a good one that has a lot of people or quite a few people. It really doesn't matter if you have a reputation and they come and hunt you out. They're not going to, you, you will get customers that are coming to buy produce from the other people, but you will also, in our case, we get a, a lot of people that we create business for the rest of the people at the farmer's market because we bring in so many of our customers uh, to that area. Um, so if you, yeah, if you decide to do a farmer's market as a means of making money, uh, be sure and uh, stick with it over time at the same place. Um, this one at Kirkwood Farmers Market has really increased over time for us. We have played around with doing sales at Farmers Market in Columbia and it just doesn't, uh, it hasn't panned out because we haven't stuck with it and we've gone at times when the rest of the, when the season at other places were over, was over. So the best of the season we went to Kirkwood. Uh, we charge 10% more for plants that we sell at uh, locations away from the nursery. Uh, and I'll get into the prices here. And that in, but that includes the taxes when we are selling it at places away from the nursery. Uh, so our, we do also do wholesale. Uh, but we're not doing very much of it. We do, we sell to Greenscapes, Gar Greenscapes Garden Center in St. Louis. Uh, and uh, they're the biggest one. And then we do have two or three other smaller ones. We are selling at a more of a true wholesale price to these people than, uh, than to other to business and organizations and uh, churches. Let me just get to the prices here. The quart pots that I showed you all ago, we are charging now 550. We went up 50 cents, I believe it was this year. Nobody has complained, and we're really lower than if you were near a big city. These prices would be cheap. Um, if you're out in the country, there'd be people watching their pennies. I think um, the small pots, no matter what the size, we sell those for two dollars and seventy-five cents which is half the price. 
So when we go to a sale away from the nursery, we're charging $6 for the big pots and $3 for the small pots. And that's very easy to figure out the amount that uh, the people is, are owing us. We may have a line of 30 people and all wanting to check out at one time. And uh, that it goes much faster if we don't have to use a calculator or look at a cheat sheet. Um, the gallons, like I showed you a while ago, that size, we have a lot of plants in, in that almost gallon or gallon and a half, and we charge $12.75 for those. And when we go to places away from the nursery this year, we are selling them for $14. Uh, when we sell to government or not-for-profit organizations or churches, uh, they get a 15% discount uh, when, we, when they uh, make a purchase. And if uh, just an ordinary uh, customer comes here and, or at some of these sales, uh, anyway, they spend over $120, we give them a 10% discount. So now I wanna go to marketing and Yeah, I had a slide, the chart. If you could put that up, Nate. There we go. Okay, so this is really revealing a lot about the nursery. This is each, uh, each little bar on there represents a year with the first one starting out there on the left at about $450 for that year in 1984. And uh, it slowly went up, <laughs> uh, very slowly went up for a while um, until we got up there to over $200,000. And uh, from there, it went on up pretty good. Uh, I'll talk about some of the reasons why it has increased. If you get to looking at there on about the 25th year, 27, anyway, it was 19, or it was 20, it was 2008, 2009 actually is when it dropped. This one, yeah. Uh, we have a stair step in there. That was the depression. That was when it just bottomed out. We were, we were running, we were struggling. Let me put it that way. Not as much as some other nurseries that I know of. Uh, but then when it, went back up it's just like the curve just kept on going and and going up uh not quite like the human population curve but not too bad um you can see that in uh, that's 2018 we had a record year and made it over a million dollars now if you had a nursery and you had it for 35 years and you finally made a million dollars, I think you, a lot of people would be very disappointed. Or if you had any kind of business, I should say. Um, this is, uh, I'm, I'm very happy with where I've got and uh, I'm having fun doing it and I'm not necessarily wanting to get rich at this. Uh, so there's a dip there this last year, and that's related to the farm bill that passed, didn't pass until late in 2018. At least I think that's what partly what is related to. And the farm farms bill generates uh, money for seed, or they give money to landowners to plant seeds. And because it uh, passed late in 2018, that caused 2019 to not have very many sales. Uh, we're looking at 2020 being fairly good, we hope. Uh, a lot of people are asking us about prices uh, at this point, but it's too early to say. <laughs> We've been stockpiling seeds for two years here now, and you reach a point where seeds go bad on you, and we had quite a few do that last year, um, and then you can't sell them. so. There are issues to deal with in the seed business. Uh, let's go on. Let's get rid of this slide now. And let me, oh yeah. 
So on marketing, uh, I have a what I refer to as the gold standard. And to explain that, I wrote a uh, brief article to uh, Carol David, the head of the Grow Native program, which I'll describe a little bit here in a, in a few minutes. Um, I said, I feel like the most productive marketing strategy that Missouri Wildflowers Nursery has had over time was to decide at the beginning, which is about 35 or, or 36 or so years ago, that Missouri would be the genetic source of our plants and that we would stick with that source requirement through time. It's our gold standard. When we run out of a species that is available for sale, we don't order in plants from another nursery unless we are confident that the genetic source meets our standards. Uh, over time, government entities, and this is important, over time, government entities, NGOs, not for government organizations, uh, and individuals have come to the realization that we stick to our guns on this standard. Uh, therefore, they use us for their source of plants, for their products, because we are meeting their specifications. They know our product is best adapted for producing and benefiting wildlife. Uh, so that's my spiel for why you should use our plants. Uh, other marketing, beneficial marketing strategies, word of mouth is very important. Uh, I realized very early on when I was actually putting the names of people in our uh, mailing list, I got to playing around with it one day and doing searches and realized that there were a lot of customers on the same street address in, in a city close together. So it's pretty obvious that they were uh, uh, recommending Missouri Wildflowers Nursery to people in the neighborhood. Um, our catalog. That's last year's. Lots of stuff on my desk, which is getting old. This is Missouri Wildflowers Nursery catalog. I hope some of you have seen that before. Um, it's, I created in my computer in design, I, I do the words, I pay a graphic artist to do the, the uh, to make it look good. So we have a photo gallery uh, with several pages of pictures. They're categorized by we have headings on the edges of the page. See where my finger is, right in there. There's shade. Uh, average to wet soil is on the other side of that spread. Um, so we have the, the pictures with them in categories. We have trees and shrubs in the back, the page for grasses. And then after we get to the pictures, we've got the price and selection guide which has some columns there for prices, but a very valuable part of that uh, guide there is the columns that describe the light and the height of the plant and the spacing of the plant and uh, the time it blooms. Um, moisture requirement. And then something I've added in the past few years, which you can hardly see probably, is these little symbols down here which represent uh, whether the butterflies like them or bees or if they're deer resistant or if hummingbirds use them. I'll probably end up with another category or two uh, in the future. Um, I also have a column in here for the page that you can find the picture on, which is helpful. So that's that catalog is very valuable. It's uh, a lot of people consider it their Bible in terms of native plants. You could use it for a guide just about to go out on a prairie and identify some plants. Um, our mailing list, we do a bulk mailing every spring and we have about 12,000 people on it. And that gets changed or updated. Sorry, I'm looking for something else. There it is. We also do a fall mailing, which has uh, items from the, the graphic artist makes it look 
but she takes stuff out of the catalog and gussies it up in the, when she does it. Uh, I write everything that goes into it. We have those two pages there. Uh, your left side, I believe, would be, uh, uh, those are places that we go to for plant sales in the fall. Okay, so the catalog and the mailing list are, are very good and they creates a lot of, a lot of uh, people asking for our catalog and, and using it. Um, I advertise on the radio station KBIA, a local national public radio station in Columbia. Uh, several years ago, I did an informal uh, survey when I was in Tulsa at a plant sale, uh, asking people to mark on a cardboard that I had set out there on a chair if they were uh, uh, NPR listeners. And it was amazing how many of my customers that came to that sale were NPR customers, so I, uh, listeners, so I decided that I need to advertise there. We also run ads in uh, mostly nature oriented publications. The uh, Conservation Federation of Missouri Magazine is one. Federated Garden Clubs, it's a small publication, but we do this partly to help the organization out. With the Conservation Federation of Missouri, they're a not-for-profit, so they're not really selling us an ad. They're, we're buying a membership at a high price, and they're giving us uh, an advertise quarter-page advertisement in their magazine four times a year when they publish it. Uh, the Gateway Gardener and the Kansas City Gardener are newspaper-like magazines that are produced monthly in Kansas City and St. Louis. Um, and we publish our schedule in there in the spring and that's the only time we run ads in it. We have, we do ads with Wild Ones, the national organization. Uh, we also get listed in uh, and you could do this easy enough uh, in, or, in uh, publications either on the internet or paper publications online um, where they're just listing native plant sources. Um, and then there's free advertising. Uh, Word of mouth, I've already mentioned. Facebook is very valuable, I think. Uh, we have a Missouri Wildflowers Nursery Facebook page. And we have, a, Missouri has a Missouri Native Plant Society. I think Arkansas has an Arkansas Native Plant Society, maybe. Our Missouri Native Plant Society has 20,000 members plus, which is pretty cool. I forget how many, well, I think they started in 2014 with their they, they really have a purpose with that, uh, the organization does with that uh, Facebook page. And then we have our own web uh, page, uh, which we sell from. And our catalog, if you wanted to, I'll try to make this available to uh, Nate to mail out to people if you want, if he wants to. But uh, you can see there our catalog online. You can download it as a PDF, I believe. Something that happened uh, just a few years after I started the nursery, uh, our local rural electric uh, organization uh, ran an article about the, me and the nursery and they've actually done it twice now. But that first time my mailing list was at about 1500 people I asked the people to, I asked in the publication uh, to uh, send us a dollar and we'd send them a catalog. And for about, I don't know, two or three weeks, we were getting you know, up to $80 a day getting catalogs. Uh, we, doubled, we doubled our mailing list at that point. We went to 3,000 in a very short time. 
Uh, there's the Grow Native program. Uh, we started in Missouri in about almost 20 years ago now. Uh, it's uh, a it's a uh, consortium. It's a, a the group of Missouri native plant producers. It's basically oh, not just plant producers, but people who uh, work in the native plant industry, like conducting burns, uh, doing landscaping or uh, design. Uh, they, uh, the Grow Native program helps to promote, promote these. And they do that with a buyer's guide, which is also online. They have a web page, which if you were to Google Grow Native, you would be able to get to that. Um, it wouldn't hurt for either people who get into doing this or maybe the Alliance down there to become members of Grow Native. I think it's like $150 a year though. Um, they have plant tapes like this. And there's another one. And one more. If I can hold them still. I don't know, they've got over a hundred, easily over a hundred different species and it's common species that you all would probably be growing. Um, that is a, a very valuable thing. With the, otherwise, you're in our case, if we don't have their tag, we produce our own tag and it doesn't come out very good sometimes. Uh, in other words, our printer needs some work. That one's better, that's the American Beauty Berry. Um, Grow Native has been very, I think, I think if you looked back at that chart, at the time Grow Native was formed and it was the Missouri Department of Conservation that started, helped to start them, or got them started. Um, they eventually uh, became uh, housed in the Missouri Prairie Foundation and they're no longer with the government or organization. Uh, yeah, you got me back there, but I'm not sure I need that. Um, there we go. Although people might rather look at the chart. Um, palette pictures. That's what I call them. Uh, when I was showing you the, I was trying to figure out where this went. When I was showing you the uh, sales area a while ago, there are these pictures that are in front of each of the uh, group of plants that are for sale out there. That's one, that's another one. If I can get it up there. Uh, you'll notice that there's a big piece of plastic up here at the top on this one. The ones that we put out in front of the, in the nursery out there doesn't have this or it would blow away in the little slot that it fits in on the sign holder. This is when we go to sales and we line rows of plants out on a table, we set the pot on top of the, the last pot, the pot closest to the edge of the table sets on top of this plastic here and keeps the picture in place. The picture is sitting on the table too. Um, these pictures are very valuable though uh, in, per, in promoting your product because um, a lot of people don't know the native plants and if they don't see a picture, that's also the value of, a, value of the catalog. Uh, I at some point can make these pictures av uh, available to the uh, Watershed Alliance if, they, if you all get organized and, and want to use them. Um, we do some local school advertising, not a lot, but uh, I mean, that's a way you can, you know, get your foot in the door and let people know what you're doing when you get started. I've always said uh, we follow the money trail. So whatever is happening, we, uh, whatever is happening that makes money, we, we go for it. Um, 
Okay, so that's the income part of it. And just briefly, I'll say a few things about the expenses. Um, cost of goods. Whatever you spend money on to produce your plants, that's cost of goods. And some of you are no doubt uh, savvy on this and others probably aren't if you've never had a business. I didn't have a business, so I didn't know beans about it. And until I started taking my uh, taxes to someone, I, I really didn't know much that much about it, even when I was doing my taxes, it seemed like. But <clears throat> the payroll at the nursery here, we made a lot of money on that uh, chart that you looked at, but we also spend a lot of money on the cost of goods. But um, we like we spend about three hundred thousand dollars on labor now, uh, and I'm paying some of the employees. It's pretty good. Um, cost of goods it includes the potting soil, the pots, anything. The shipping is part of it. Uh, our bills on the UPS are huge in the spring. Pretty good sized right now because we're sending out quite a bit also. Um, I haven't, sorry, I'm going to look and see what, I'm running out of time. Do we wanna quit? I'm at the end as far as I'm concerned. Although I could tell you what's in our potting soil and uh, and I've already mentioned that we direct seed pots. Hey Mervin, we do. This is Nate. We do have uh, some questions we'd like to get answered, but um, I, I'm happy for you to talk as much as you'd like. I'm 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 at the end here. Okay, well let's go ahead and get some some questions uh, answered if you would. Um, we have five questions in the in the Q and A box. If you have any other questions, just feel free to to put them in there. Uh, I'm going to start at the top. This is from Gwen Gregory. Uh, she's asking, does using pond water for plants introduce bacteria or other organism, organisms which would harm the plants? We've never, uh, we've never experienced any problem other than, yeah, the plants get a sheen on them and I think they decided it was some kind of a bacteria, but it's not killed the plants, it just makes them look bad. Uh, I don't know the details on that for sure, so I, I hate to say, but no, the pond water is, pH-wise, is about the same as the well water. Uh, I would rather be using pond water because our water here is very hard out of the well, so we would be getting a crusty lime layer on the surface if we were using our well water. And I just hate to use well water is a precious resource and water running off the land is going to end up in the ocean and carry a lot of stuff with it in the process. So we don't, and here where I'm located, we don't have any problem with uh, runoff from, our biggest hazard here is the highway runs right upstream from the highway 54, right upstream from the pond. If there was a wreck, we could have, it would be disastrous if, if a chemical spill occurred uh, we, we'd have a serious problem. And I have contemplated drilling a well just for that, but that's a big expense to not ever have happen, I guess. And uh, Mikkel has a question of the beauty berry you showed. Did you start with, did you basically up plant it? Did you start it in a smaller pot, pot up until you got to a gallon? We, we are growing some of the shrubs in these pots uh, for a year and then putting them into gallons. Uh, we don't grow little tiny plugs and put into anything any of any species. We don't do that. But a lot of the people in the nursery businesses do that. And they've got machines that will poke little tiny plugs out of a tray into a quart pots like this. Um, no, the beauty berry, it's gone. This is the second transplant to get to here. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Okay, and Emily Robertson is asking, have you seen much change in demand for native plants over the past few years? 
Well, the chart showed it going up. So uh, it's there, but it, it also takes, uh, one thing that generated a big uh, demand for plants was the, when people became uh, aware of the monarch problems, uh, that caused a lot of, uh, that brought on a lot of uh, demand for plants and seeds. Okay, and Carolyn Tedford is asking, what is the best size of a high tunnel for someone just starting out? <laughs> I don't know. Do you not have it designated? I would, if you could do it, if you can get a 20 foot wide one, I think you'd be happy with it. It's easy to put the plastic on. Um, much easier than the 30 foot wide one. But uh, the 16 foot wide ones, there's quite a few of those. You've got a lot more space in the in the 20 foot wide. And all of our greenhouses are 96 feet long. So you buy a 100 foot sheet of plastic, which is the correct width to cover it. And, and that's, uh, that's a standard size. Uh, Meckel's asking, can you share your pallet pictures and in, in PDF form possibly? I could. That's a lot of, if I, I could do it for uh, each species easier than to just fix up all, what, two or three hundred, two hundred probably that we've got. I'm not sure how many I've got of them. Um, but we could do that, yeah. Okay, uh, Tracy Oates is asking, what's in your potting soil and do you have a preference for potting soil mixtures? Oh, good, you got to that. We have approximately a third rye soils, uh, approximately a third compost and, a, and about a third pine bark, but we also have some turfus in it, which is that stuff they use on tracks, or they used to anyway, and they, amend soil and uh, golf courses with it. It's baked clay basically in small particles. And we have some granular fertilizer, uh, but you don't want to use Osmocote if you're planting seedlings into it because Osmocote can uh, leach the fertilizer out when the plants are not growing. And then when they do, if they germinate or if you plug the plant into the, uh, pot, they can die almost instantly because it's like putting them in a lot of salt solution because you've increased the fertilizer. Um, so that's, oh, and we get our potting soil. It'd be great if you have someone down there who does composting and a good job of it and also tries to sell their compost by mixing it with other ingredients for homeowners to use. Uh, we get St. Louis composting to make our potting soil now. And all of the ingredients, those three main ones that I named, they are already composted and they're black when they put them in the, mix them together to, to uh, make our potting soil. And they've got the equipment to make uh, whatever ratios of uh, ingredients we want, they can do it and other companies have them make their own special mixes. So it's, uh, it, if you could find somebody, you wouldn't want to have them bring the potting soil down to Arkansas because it cost you a whole lot more than it does. They've upped their price on it quite a bit in the past uh, year, I think, but, and I don't know how much it is now, but still. Uh, we used to buy the, buy the ingredients and put them in a, pile and get them delivered in piles out here and then we would mix them and we'd compost them and invariably we needed the uh, uh, potting soil before it was ready and so we'd be out there trying to plant and it would be on the warm side or, and it would be brown instead of black and all of that so it's a whole much a whole lot more uh, useful to use this uh, St. Louis composting for our source. Okay. 
Um, several people, myself included, were highly interested in the in the uh, compost mix. Um, could you run those three ingredients by us again? It's a uh, one third rice hulls, one third compost, and one third pine bark. That's roughly it. And I don't know how much of that turfus they add. I can find out and get it to you. Um, and then the granular fertilizer, I also don't know because the St. Louis composting just adds it and we don't, we don't ask them to specify uh, an amount. All right. All I know is that fertilizer is green. <laughs> Okay, and uh, Emily was asking a follow-up question of, do you have an explanation for the big increase in demand? Is it a change in the culture or just your good business practices getting good results? I think a lot of it has to do with uh, Douglas Tallamy coming out with his book however many years ago. And it's just, and Facebook, everybody talks about it. It's just, everything happened, not exactly at the same time, but it happened pretty quick. And uh, people want to do something for the environment. It's just everything, uh, and this is something you can do for the environment at your in your home. You know, as plant natives, and and you can see the results with the butterflies and uh, insects, pollinators showing up. And now that people are being made aware that pollination or pollinators need help, and butterflies do, uh, they want to do something for them. So it, it's a combination of several things happening all at once. Okay, and uh, I just had one question myself. Looks like that's the, the remainder of the questions that have been typed in thus far. Um, do you see any significant profit margin differences between species or groups of species? Um, like do some species or container sizes seem more profitable than others? Uh, you're asking if I, I'm sorry, I zoned out, basically. Uh, basically, what sells well? Some of them better than others. Some sell better than others. That's what you're asking? You're right. Um, yeah, and that's always the case. And we just, uh, we keep a record. We use the computer and spreadsheets a lot. Uh, uh, we also use Airtable, by the way, to keep our inventory. Um, we keep track of what we produce each year and we pay attention to what uh, we have left over and if it doesn't sell well, so we adjust up or down what we're going to produce uh, each year. Well, okay, those all sound like wonderful answers. Um, we don't have any more Q&A questions coming in. Um, I just wanna, well, we got one more. <laughs> what is selling well this year? Well, we tried, to sell, that. we tried to sell the American Beauty Berry because we made it our native plant of the year, which we pick a species every year and do that or try to. Uh, the reason uh, we aren't selling as many is because we go to the, we usually go to the best of Missouri market in St. Louis. We, sell three or 400 plants at, at that one event, uh, Friday through Sunday. Um, and that didn't happen this year, so we're setting with a lot of them. Um, I, I could apologize for the look of my background on this picture here, but uh, that uh, whatever it is over there in the corner, halos, halos, that's where we keep our palette pictures. We have to have a set of these I call them palette pictures. We have to have a set of these things uh, for all those sales we go to. So if we're going to four sales on a weekend, we need four sets of these. We don't have to have every species that we sell, but for whatever is selling at that time, we have to have that many. It's okay. a lot bigger nursery than it used to be. <laughs> that sounds like a fun problem to have. Well, um, I just want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, Mervyn, I, I really want to thank you. Um, we were fortunate we didn't have any, any technical difficulties today. Um, 
That was a very, very educational program, I think. Um, if anyone has any, any questions, feel free to email me, nate at beaverwatershedalliance.org. Or if you're a, a landowner in the Northwest Arkansas region and you think you might qualify for our pilot program, feel free to let me know. Um, let me share my screen real quick. We do have one more uh, webinar coming up. And uh, this is going to be, okay, um, we were originally going to do a field trip this year. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic put, put a hamper on that. And so what we decided to do was go take a video session with uh, Dripping Springs Garden out around Huntsville, Arkansas. And uh, the gentleman who runs this, Mark Kane, is an expert with operating high tunnels, and especially with the NRCS program. And uh, so he is going to give some very good, in, very good information and feedback and uh, advice on operating a high tunnel uh, in this video. Um, we were hoping that Mark would be able to join us for uh, this live viewing. Um, unfortunately, he's having cataract surgery that day, and he, he may or may not be able to join us. But um, if you have any questions for, for Mark, um, please let me know, and I'd be happy to share those with him. And uh, we'd be happy to, to share those in the program as well. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, feel free to sign up for our October 28th uh, viewing as well. Um, I say share any final questions you might have with me and I uh, wish you all have a wonderful day and thank you very much for participating.